Singapore, is it time for pitchforks? Singapore has often seen as one of the wealthiest nations in the world, but at the same time, it reportedly has one of the highest levels of income inequality among developed countries. Will you agree with the statement? Uh, I agree with that, yes. Yes, I agree with the statement. Because uh, for me, I have to work a part-time job in order to like survive like, in Singapore alone because now everything is expensive. Yes, because um, there's always like, news articles and like documentaries, especially like, uh, like Singapore's context, right? Where there's the wealth gap in between like, low-income families and the high income. So there's always like, neighborhoods where you can actually find those like, low-income families that are often struggling. And they're often like, living by paycheck to paycheck, so it's very difficult. And also it's not that fair, because um, in Singapore's like, context now, right, to get a good job, you need to have a good education. And not many people have that opportunity or that luxury to get that for themselves. So, yeah. Then how serious also, you made the connections too. So, but that is an excellent uh, point. That I mean, yeah, you're not gonna have the opportunities to to escape your situation. And essentially, like you have to be if if you're realistic. I mean, the rich are gonna just get richer. Serious of a social issue? Do you think income or wealth inequality is in Singapore? I think it's serious enough to be noted as an issue, but not serious enough to be addressed first due to the other issues happening throughout Singapore. For example, the housing uh, housing issues and the space available. I think it really affects when it comes to cost of living because of huge um, income gaps within the society. Um, it gets increasingly increasingly difficult to like own a house in Singapore and also like um, affording like food, groceries, transport, just the basic necessities. Yeah. Uh, I mean, compared to other countries. Yeah, that's not great. So I think that it's actually quite okay over here. I mean, uh, based from other countries I visited and friends that live in other countries, I mean, the wealth like distribution of the class system is a lot harsher than it is here. I mean, Singapore still offers housing, uh, lower prices, and it actually financially it, it helps a lot financially. Yeah, because like the Singapore culture, you know, everybody's so competitive that I mean. I know definitely everybody will feel bad. Like if they see anybody suffering um, unfairly, right? They want to do something about it. But at the same time, um, it, I think a lot of it's also like as long as it's not me mentality, you know. Like I can copy as long as I'm doing better than somebody. That's good. So that, on that side, there's I guess the thing because they wouldn't want to be in that position. Uh, because who wants to be poor, right? So if, if they want any advantage, they can get to further themselves in life. That's why Singapore is able to progress so much because uh, we're always pushing forward and then we're trying to um, raise our quality of our standard of living, right? And if that if, if being poor is a deterrent, that forces us to to put more effort and try to excel in life. Can you provide some example? Damn, that's a pretty low statement. But it just uh, spoke true. So essentially the poor, and especially the underclass, always serves as a deterrent. But even the lower class, which you should call the working class, serves as a deterrent. And if, well, in the European context, if you have some investments, I mean, you probably, well, if you have 1 million investments, then you make more than the average person. So, yeah, I mean, just just taking out the, the safe 4% of it. Yeah examples from your personal experience or do you notice or feel any significant wealth gaps between different groups of people in Singapore? Yes, due to the price increase and the increase of food in general. And due to these price increases, a lot of my favorite food has closed down. Uh, it depends on the people. Uh. Because usually for me, I can survive like around $10 a day. Yeah. And I mostly usually eat at home. So I have a friend uh, who is like some like very rich and probably messages. But yeah, they also say like, it's pretty expensive to live in Singapore. And for like a person like me, like, which is like an average income uh, household, so, yeah, I usually have to work to survive in order to live in Singapore. Yeah, I, I think something that you notice straight away, and, and which we call in Singapore, is all, like having a helper at home. So, how much you pay the helper versus how much you get paid. I think there, there is a level of disparity there, but I don't think... How much you pay the living maid? Uh, I think this guy might be upper class or more. <laughs> I wouldn't say that you feel like the income is unequal per se because of like things like the exchange rate and how, how much earning here is actually enough to support her, um, like her family back home. Yeah, so I, I guess that's a really clear example of like um, like a wage gap. Uh, okay, so yeah, one thing is this particular I myself was I used to be in international school and when you and when you compare like, international schools and local schools here in local schools, depending on you know when you start at your neighborhood school, you can easily attend and pay fees like less than hundred dollar less than hundred dollars a month. It can go to even three sometimes for citizens. And then when you go up to international schools, some of these schools can go up to 30, 40, and I think uh, even I think after COVID, it's over fifty thousand for some of these schools. So already seen something as basic as education. There's such a huge there's such a huge huge gap. Right? I mean, from five dollars to fifty thousand dollars is an absolutely ridiculous difference. And it's not that in Singapore that public schooling is you know it's bad. I think Singapore public uh, Singapore's public schooling system is one of the best in the world. And I think mm -hmm. it was, that's probably one of the most common example you see that it's almost two completely different lives and uh, you know it's like two completely different sides of the country, two different types of people. Everyone seems to be. Yeah, but like uh, I guess there is a a gap between what well well even the free education is, is supposedly good, but like suppose you have more money, then you might be able to afford more. To be saying that housing is a major issue. Could you explain how unaffordable housing is for average people? Um, in terms of housing, I think yes, uh, housing in Singapore is quite expensive because of all the foreigners like they are coming in to buy our properties. Maybe the prices keep rising because the supply of land in Singapore is so limited, but the demand is quite high. You know, we have foreigners and we have locals all trying to like fight for the same housing. And that's where our you know public housing comes in to try and combat this. And on top of that, we have, uh, the government has I think imposed like some tax rates to stop people from buying more than one property or selling their property too fast to make like a uh, quick cash. Uh, yeah. 
I can't really speak for most people, but for myself, uh, as a student, uh, I, I'm definitely worried about uh, owning a house in Singapore um, because you know I've been keeping up with the news and there's a lot of uh, attention on um, HDB flats that are sold for more than a uh, million dollars. So it does make me a little bit worried about um, what's to come in the future. I would say that, yeah, I mean, definitely in certain parts of the resale market, it's getting a bit unsustainable where you have like million dollar flats. But I would say to like people like me who are just starting out, I think housing is, can still be pretty affordable, and especially with the measures that the government has just uh, put in place. I think there's a lot more uh, grants available, especially for those, especially for singles now who are looking to buy flats, as well as for uh, like first-time homeowners, like, especially if you're, you're living near your parents. Like, that's something that I took advantage of as well when I bought my resale flat. Yeah. Singapore is so expensive to buy a house. Like. It's so bad. Like, I've even considered maybe like I just stay with my mom. Like, I don't know. Well, that guy's definitely a rich boy. Because um, I feel like I may be running out of time also because I'm already in my 20s, right? Like I'm already just starting my 20s and I feel the need to start my money. However, I just want to get to be able to live my life and like buy stuff that I really want. But there's always the point in my mind where like, what if I do not have time to like, save up money to get a house also, especially with like, a partner. Yeah, so that's the answer, uh, uncertainty. Yeah. Then how are you supposed to get a house? How can you afford to get a house? I think uh, the most important... Yeah, is this a good way to run society? Everyone's just, you know, in a frenzy, competing with each other to possibly not die? Uh... Most important is to have high income, high earning power, and then possibly considering having side hustles or other streams of income. Uh, that could possibly help. But also, I know of, of um, more privileged um, friends with um, huge family support, whereby um, their families are we're very willing to downgrade their house for them. So you can see there's um, different different like um, options out there for Singaporeans. But for a very regular um, housing Singaporean, um, it really starts with having a solid paying job. Yeah. I mean, the most common way of buying a house is you own up. Yeah, but that's pretty unlikely, and your well, your income is going to be more dependent on how much uh, savings how much how many assets you have all right certainly uh, a good job can be amazing but your likelihood to get a good job is also highly dependent on your connections and your education enough money then you can get a mortgage and then you take a loan to the bank and you keep paying it off for the next like, 20 30 years and otherwise, I mean, there's no direct solution. I guess it's just an inherent problem. And it's not a problem in just Singapore. It's a problem in almost every metropolitan city in the world. I mean, you New York, London. Uh, and I mean, it's slowly going to be other places in Southeast Asia as well. Um, Southeast Asia in general, the economy is, you know, it's been going very fast. And eventually, other places are becoming more expensive. But yeah, in Singapore, it's becoming a fairly unaffordable place to live and buy, and buy a house, even if you're staying in public housing. So to say that I don't think there's any solution. I think it's just a problem. It's just a problem in house. It's maybe just a cost of living in such a very safe and big city. Um, I think one common thing that most people go through is uh, you stay with your parents for a while. Um, you live with them, and then uh, once you eventually save up, find a partner, um, you can like look towards a BTO or maybe resale, which, which is much more expensive. Uh. Um, I think the government also has incentives that they've thrown out. Like if you stay near your parents, you get a certain amount of uh, percentage of the HDB you purchase or your BTO. Uh, if you purchase a uh, housing with uh, a partner, you also get I think a discount as well, something along those lines. Yeah. Can you explain what BTO is for a non-Singaporean? <laughs> um, BTO is called a uh, built to order. So it's basically um, you, I guess, in a sense, bid against other people to purchase um, a property that hasn't been built yet. So that's why it's called built to order. Yeah, so once you get this purchase, and there's enough people that purchase uh, this property at a certain location, then you start building the uh, property itself. So if it's true that Singapore is a wealthy nation and everyone seems to be relatively well off compared to less developed countries, why do you think that there's still this issue of income and wealth inequality to begin with, and why does this happen? Okay, um, I think it's uh, broken down into um, different ages. Okay, so uh, most of the people with low income, most of them are elderly. Uh, yeah, so in the past, maybe uh, education wasn't emphasized so much as it is now in Singapore. So maybe due to that, the fact that uh, they were working like factory jobs and all that stuff, you know, economy has changed so much from like being a production society into like one more of like technology and knowledge. I think that transition caused a lot of people to lose their jobs, uh, mainly like the upper like ages, and then yeah, this inequality of uh, income happened. Yeah, so those that couldn't adapt, I guess they fell out and uh, couldn't if they if they can't keep up with like all the technological changes we're going through and you know they can't adapt to all these changes because we are moving quite fast as a country. Then I think that's where the gap starts to come in, and that's how people uh, get poorer or like there's an income inequality gap. And then one, once that gap comes in, like someone who's like maybe a grandmother who's like not so wealthy, then she has to support her children. Maybe she can't support them. Then they can't go to school. Um, then they you know can't get education, and the cycle just keeps repeating. And they're stuck in this loop of uh, I guess lower income class. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a systemic issue. Yeah, I mean most stay in their class. <laughs> it is far more common to fall down a class than to move up, unless you are uh, special. That might not even happen because keep in mind that people have investments, so that's generating good money. The the way to move up. I mean you might. People might argue that you can become more affluent, and that, that is fine, but you have to keep in mind that others are getting more affluent while you're getting more affluent. So, yeah, unless you can secure a lot of income and uh, use it to invest it, yeah, you might not move up. That Singapore is trying really hard to adjust, you know? But now, suppose you're like a regular Joe who's like making like I don't know, like 50k, and you feel like, yes, I make more than, than most people. And like, but you're going up against those who are like making 200k or more and already have savings. Essentially, the gap between you and them is only getting wider. But at the same time, like, if you look at like the socioeconomic statuses of um, different people, right, there are those that seem to have a leg up on life and those that don't. I mean, at the same time, I know that the government will do whatever they can, right, to, to ensure that you are covered. Like now, now, um, 
Yeah, yeah, you know, education is free all the way through like school levels, right? Like, like sec four. So, so that's a positive. Uh, one aspect would be the there's not enough jobs around Singapore due to the current influx of people and the density of our country. But also, without the density of the country, there won't be enough jobs. So it's really a vice versa thing. Can you elaborate more about the influx of people coming to Singapore? Because currently, that's I, that's what I feel like that our country is going very fast exponentially. Maybe a bit too fast for our current situation. Then there is too many people around. In my for my personal opinion, and these days. Uh, I think. This, this is going to sound tacky, but I think a lot more of uh, like outside foreigners, let's say from the UK, that come in, uh, that are hired from companies to come in Singapore. This sounds really tacky, but um, I guess you could see that as uh, companies choosing to use foreign uh, work, foreign workers instead of Singaporean workers for their companies. I would say with the competitiveness, competitiveness of like trying to find a job nowadays, because everyone is trying to fight for like a spot on like a table to like um, to be able to earn money to support themselves, but it's really hard because, uh, like I said, not everyone has like the privilege to get a very good education. And nowadays, jobs they really require you to get a good educational like level certificate to be able to even get hired for a job. So it's really a struggle because uh, I've heard from some people they apply hundred jobs, but yet they still don't get any callbacks. But I mean, they're still young la, and they still have a roof over their heads. So what about, what about those people who don't even have that to begin with? So they're really struggling more. Because uh, uh, even though we are pretty well off, you still see homeless people on the streets, and it's really sad to see. Do you believe that anyone that works hard or is smart can climb up the social ladder to become wealthy in Singaporean society? Uh, yes, I think honestly, if they apply themselves, right, like they focus on what matters to them. If they have a driving motivator to do better in life. Uh, and they focus on their goal, they don't straight, uh, stray away from that, then yeah, they have a good chance of succeeding. You know? But obviously it helps if you are well off to begin with, but, but at the same time, like anybody should, if they all start at the same level, right? everybody has the same level of education, and they progress together, right? If they don't stray away from that, they should be able to succeed. Working hard is not... This is a naive take, unfortunately. I, I, I don't want to come off as negative, but you have to assume that others are getting even more ahead. The only way you would get ahead of those who are already start better than you if they are somehow playing worse than you or somehow they got a really bad head in life like hellfires or something but if you're assuming that they are even making greater uh, strides than you then you're just gonna well you're kind of getting ahead compared to where you were but they are getting even more ahead <sighs> so it's not great and also he said that like working smart and hard, yeah, sure, you need to do both. But I think the prevailing view these days, and this is what you might see, the, those who are rich might express that you need to work hard, smart, and get lucky. If you really want to make it break. If you are like, if we are talking about really moving up. It's not really always. It's not really enough to be successful. You need to have. You need to have the right kind of attitude. You need to have more the maybe right environment. And to some extent, luck, luck is a huge part of it. You know, if you're now, I, either these people are somewhat indoctrinated, or perhaps what would be what I would be assuming that perhaps this is like a more of a rich area. Like I don't see many homeless lying on the streets. So I mean, their view can reflect that. If you invite the people around you, your now, for example, if someone's like upper middle class and they they are. They just went to all the right schools and then, then got, got a good job. And they, they, they all say that, you know, it's all about working hard and, and smart, right? <clears throat> yeah, that, but that might not be enough for many below. Your parents, whoever you interact with the most, they're from a slightly wealthy background and they are from a particular, you know, they work in maybe a you know, high-paying corporate job. Then it's more likely that you will end up on the same path. Now, let's say you come from a, you come from a low-income family, your parents did not, they didn't go to university, they were the working class. It's not to say that you can't move up the ladder, but it's definitely harder and I think that's just how it is. It is not always about just working hard, it's a lot about what type of background you're from, what type of, you know, what the cards you've been dealt. And yeah, hard work, skills and luck also plays a very big part in my opinion. If you're somebody who's just struggling to pay your bills, I mean, you can't really be worrying about 20 years later, you're worrying about can you put food on the table tomorrow. So I think that's the main factor. What factors do you think? That's an excellent point, by the way. And that would be one of the one of the ec extra factors to consider for UBI that people can't even really contribute in a meaningful or a more meaningful way to society because they are too busy uh, to not to die. Right? We we say that you know you need you need X amount of money for living costs, but if you fall below that, then good luck. Do you think um, whole young people back from climbing up the social ladder? Maybe they, uh, again, I, I can't really speak on behalf of them, but um, in my opinion, it could be... Yeah, this is going to be brutal, but I mean, assuming everyone, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna say this, uh, this is going to be brutal. Assuming everyone plays well, then not only, even if you play well, you can't climb up the social ladder, but only going to be, be, end up ending up lower. Sure, you got to make some money, you might, you know, you might make like $1 million, right? Uh, eventually, but... In the same time, they're gonna make twenty, unless you find out find some better way to really make some real cash. Um, perhaps a lack of access to um, certain materials or tuitions um, for the younger um, um, generation. Thank you. Yeah. And for yourself, perhaps what options do you think you have? 
as a student, I definitely find it very hard to um, juggle between being a full-time student and a part-time worker. Um, so I'm actually struggling a little bit to find my footing, but um, I'm quite certain that yeah, maybe through my own like, working hard to um, apply for more part-time jobs, that would that really help, I think. Because they're really provisional. That's interesting. I mean, ultimately, people need to believe that their efforts will be rewarded because, like, it is just too depressing not to. Um, but also, like, you have to keep in mind that this guy works part-time to okay. But also, he might be going up against those who fully focusing on their studies and possibly learning in the, the very best schools. And when it really comes down to it, who's going to get the biggest money jobs, uh, it's probably not going to be him, right? Apply for more part-time jobs. That, would, that really help, I think. Because they're really privileged enough to get a good education and like have maybe like a good family background to give themselves a boost. Because with connections all around, right, you're able to get anywhere in life when you have good connections, no matter how bad of a spot you are. So it's almost like it's almost like cheating in the game, and it's a bit unfair because there are people who generally work hard. It's just that they do not get as much opportunities in life. So yeah. Then why do you think that is? Uh, what are some? Yeah, it's always like nepotism. Well, I guess mm, I guess what we like power, like money, money, nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> then like prestige or like your your actual skills, I suppose. There are some factors that will hold young people back. I would say connections, because people now, right, they're also, how say, like, they're going to uni just to build up more connections with people so that uh, when, once they graduate, right, they know all people so they can get around and, like, it's very easy to get opportunities. Have you seen anyone who made... Yeah, but, like, <laughs> that's interesting. Like, suppose you could wish for things. What would you wish for? Suppose you could wish for, like, $100 million. I mean, that would be good. That would be better than connections, right? So money, money would definitely trump there. But also, like, if you have connections, then, like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to be the, the, I don't know, the, the second-hand guy or, or whatever. I'm gonna be. You might get some some idiotic role. It really doesn't matter. You could be some kind of manager who makes like half a million dollars, right? Because because of some reason that that could that would be like connections. Like yeah, that's pretty great. You know, if you if you go the the school route, then you're just kind of hoping to to get in because you're hoping to just bedazzle them with your degree. I mean, sure, you might get a degree anyway, but like the the good roles might just go to those who with the connections, right? Who made it by themselves without having rich parents in Singapore society? In Singapore society? Um, not in Singapore society. But the reason why I think this topic is quite close to me is because my dad, um, his family, but he was in Malaysia, of course, his family wasn't so rich. Um, he had a family of, I think, 12 people. So he had to, his, uh, his father, my grandfather, worked very hard to like, keep them afloat, try to send them off to other countries so that they could uh, gain better opportunities and live a better lifestyle. Uh, so, yeah. My ex-employer was uh, self-made, so he's, uh, he runs a, a consumer electronics brand that I think a lot of Singaporeans would be very familiar with. Uh, yeah, so he kind of started the, the business himself, so started with dropshipping without a lot of initial funding, stuff that he saved basically and he got some other friends who chipped in. And now, you know what, it's one of the biggest, uh, I guess, like local electronics companies now. So yeah, I guess that's a great example, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, and like, I would say they go very, um unconventional routes because like some do decide to be an entrepreneur and they quit school and they start something of their own and it's possible but you know things that we see in media is just like the top one two percent right that they do make it in life so there are stories like that but it's just how often it do happen yeah it doesn't happen like there are uh topics that covered well there are i guess like a book that covers it like uh, the miraculous funds so there are always like people who who move up or possibly move up in a big way and they always highlight it as moving up is possible but if you just look at how much money you're going to make. And that is entirely, well, well, it greatly depends on where you were born and the conditions in which you were born. Most people are not even going to move up even one class or that most people are just going to stay in their class. And that's it. How, how would that even work? How are you going to move up? <laughs> Again, they would need to, like the way to move up, assuming that everyone just really mostly plays their interest is that somehow the, the upper classes somehow became like class traitors and started working against themselves somehow and uh, it doesn't really make sense okay again your efforts supposedly let your some your poor guy who's like you know like maybe like a roofer making like 40k a year maybe like not a poor but like you know you, you work hard know that i'm not not uh disparaging it but then then you have the 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 banker guy who with the rich daddy and you know got an apartment that makes like four hundred thousand. And you might think like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get rich too. But like, you know, in the same time, you're actually just getting more behind. Okay, that's this one girl that I don't really like in secondary school. But, okay, cause right, some context, she didn't really put in effort in school. She always like sitting in class and all that. But even then she still found a way to support herself by doing like these small businesses. Like um, she'll buy water supplies and she's able to make a living for herself. Especially cause like in the Chinese market, right? Cause she mostly promotes her products in Chinese. So she's able to reach a wider range of audiences. Even though I don't like her, but it's nice to see that she's able to do something for herself. Yeah. Then what kind of job or work do you think you need to have in order to really climb up the social ladder to become a multi-millionaire or even a billionaire? And is it even possible? I believe it's not possible to be a billionaire, especially here in Singapore. But 
those people who are billionaires in Singapore usually either who already are up in the social ladder or they are from other countries who is already a citizen here. Well, no one's gonna give you a billion dollars. You have to make it yourself or make other people make it for you. I think uh, in our modern society, it's very difficult to become a millionaire or a billionaire. Uh, cause, I mean, there's so many ideas going on right now. And um, I guess you could climb up the social ladder. This is a bad example, but um, my, my brother's in national service right now. And he sees a lot of his friends uh, climbing up the social ladder, mainly for the military. And then you form more connections through NS. Like surprisingly, you form a lot of connections through NS. And I guess that does actually help you build up. But I wouldn't know if that makes you a billionaire. I, I don't think that is on the agenda of a lot of like, I don't think that fits into what a lot of the, the regular Singaporean hopes to achieve. So I would say that that is very difficult. I think you would have to have re a really like solid, like, either like, like a business plan or and like really have like that, that knowledge and skill set, especially if you're building like your own personal brand and business. Yeah. So what well, billionaire, multi-millionaire, yeah, really, man. I feel like that involves so much more uh, management because like, it's not something that I think you can build by yourself and you probably need to assemble a team, find investors, that kind of thing. So yeah, challenging. Yeah, but I think definitely possible if you have the right mindset and as well as you're willing to like learn. Yeah. What would you think would be the average like, aspiration for a typical Singaporean? Honestly, I think like the traditional Singapore dream is to just, you know, like own a home, like so like a HDB, have a family. Know that the games are like the Sims are are popular. It's like you can live out both fantasies, like owning a home, family, settle down. I mean, some people want to have like not being alone, like a car, go on holidays. I think that's eating food. It's very this is a very standard uh, Singaporean dream, and I think the majority of Singaporeans, I would say, still kind of subscribe to that. Yeah. And also, do you believe that you are? But also, this is a good take that via traditional employment, unless you're handed really high paying positions, uh, your chance of moving up are very very slim. I mean, it's probably not happening. Let, let's, just, let's just be realistic and just uh, complete, well, try to eliminate luck here. And like, unless you are somehow handed a high paying position, you're probably not moving up. Sure, you might be earning some good money, but others are, who you are competing with are even earning more money than you. So, I mean, yeah, you would need to do a business, which is uh, not as easy as uh, the YouTubers might uh, lead you to believe that you are better off or worse off than your parents' generation in terms of opportunities. I believe we are better in terms of generations because we have technology to back us up. And we actually have more opportunities rather than our uh, parents' generation time. But I believe that back then, in our parents' generation time, it's much more easier to climb the social ladders as opposed to now. I do think that I am in a better position than my parents, solely because my parents um, put me to where I am, to a spot where I get better opportunities. For one is um, the option of getting to a university. Um, which is not as prevalent in my parents' generation. And through going to university, I get to know different types of people, different types of industry, as well as roles that I could get myself into before I start my first career, which definitely helped. Wow, that's a good question. So uh, I think definitely better off. I think that there's lots of new interesting job opportunities that are emerging now because of things like AI um, and tech. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a really huge new sector, which I think is, is growing. And there, there, I mean, which existed back then as well, but maybe not to as large an extent. I will say, though, that um, my parents' generation, especially when, when I was born in like, the 90s, I think that's when you know, Singapore was in a, in a particular stage of like rapid growth. So and I think... Uh, what we spoke about earlier about that, that aspect of being like you know being self-made. I think that was a lot stronger back then because you know the economy was, was really doing well, or at least it was picking up rapidly. Uh, right, Singapore was one of the like, four Asian tigers back then uh, in terms of like the, the size of their, their, their economies. So yeah, so a little wins on both sides. Yeah. This issue is actually a global issue and not just a Singaporean issue. Yeah. For Singapore, how do you think this issue can be addressed, and or is it almost an inevitable consequence of capitalism, and not much can be done about it? Um, I think that there are a lot of things. I think is, it it kind of serves the status quo. Those who have the power. I mean, what, what are the unemployed homeless gonna, or at least uh, the poor homeless are gonna, or the, the poor gonna do about it, hmm? Seriously, they have no power. Things that can be done about it is whether you can eliminate it or not. I think it's a... Uh... I think a better question is whether people actually want to eliminate it. Especially if they have it good. Uh, a problem that will always be there, in terms of... Uh, in, a, in a sad way, that for, for there to be winners, there must be uh, losers in a sense. Um, so I think uh, Singapore is... But must there be losers? I mean, I, I understand. Sure. I, 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 could, I could accept this argumentation, but like, the, what, are we, what are we really calling losers here? I mean, the loser really should be someone, in my opinion, as someone who has a house, can, can afford food, and is making okay money, right? I mean, that could be the loser, right? Oh, is closing that gap between like... Um... Uh, in terms of people not being employed and people being employed and uh, the income gap, I think. Because uh, they do give incentives to those of a lower income class. Um, they do, I guess, provide vouchers and stuff. They, they do provide like cheaper housing. But in terms of um, quality-wise, I'm not sure whether it's up to the, uh, up to, um, the preference of those who live there. Yeah. The Singapore government has various policies aimed at reducing income inequality. How effective do you think these measures are in addressing the wealth gap? Mm, I think that these issues address the wealth gap in the sense that they're giving out money to people, but they're not telling people what to do or how to be successful in their future. So. 
do they give up money to people? Also, if they cannot invest it into assets, then it's not going to be that useful. Suppose you, like, suppose they can afford to pay mortgage for it, then I, even that is something, right? In a sense that they're just giving them a lifeboat to float on, but you're eventually saying without any advice from, how to say, advice on how to find jobs or how to get things. First, the government... Is it really an advice problem, though? I mean, if the opportunities out there were so obvious and um, and abundant, then then they would probably go for that, right? People well, throughout the whole video just kind of kept uh, hinting that it is very, very competitive, right? And then you say like, oh yeah, man, and you know why the poor are poor? Because they're stupid. That's that's why they need my advice. Government, yeah, these are all the financial schemes that hate, but yeah, people just spend it for them. They cannot find a job. Yeah. Then how would they be able to continue living off? So in a sense, the government is just emptying their treasury for the Singaporeans, but not creating any revenue for us. Aww. I think also government is trying to help. And that was very carefully worded. In terms of training and upskilling, upskilling people so they can get better jobs. But that is something that's definitely more long term. It's not something that suddenly that people start suddenly getting jobs because there needs to be new jobs and opportunities for that as well. But overall, I think yeah, I'm, I think the government has done a good has done a good job already addressing issue of income inequality. However, they've also definitely done a good job at have they hiding income inequality, which can be good or bad based on how you. Uh, and I think to say inequality is just, um, it is just, it's just there everywhere in the world. It's not something that's going to ever go away. And it's not necessarily something that can be completely contained. But I think just, you know, you have to really put it in. And if you have secure resources to do well, if you have, if you've been doing a good life, I think just make the best of it and, you know, just count your blessings. And maybe if you're from a tougher situation and you have to work harder, I think just, you know, stay focused and have faith that one day will work out for you. I think the rest is kind of just out of our control. Right. 